So we're going to look at it. We're going to be um, ex exploring it so that when you have friends and you want to recommend that they watch the videos or they, you know, follow whatever, I want to show you exactly how they can do that. I have been working very diligently over the last couple weeks in getting this website. It got published last week, um, worked on it a couple weeks before that, and I'm continuing to add to it just about every other day. So we're going to go there. Let's go into a share screen. Um, And the, and the website is godsfoundationbuilders.com. So I'm going in. And you accept the cookies when you come in. Notice at the very top is shop for book. And then we have the... Um, I'm going to fill the fullness of the screen so you're not just seeing... Then we have, as we come down, you'll notice I'll see the Accuser 3rd Edition. If you click on that, it's going to take you to lulu.com, where you can either get the spiral or the bound um, book. And you just add it to your cart and go on from there. We come down further, and there's Silence the Accuser, Kindle. You click on that and it will take you to Amazon to purchase it. This is information about us. Um, this is products we have for sale on the website. These are all the PDF products. Then here's some pictures from our different mission trips. And then if you want to donate, there's a donate button, which will take both um, debit card and credit cards through PayPal. You do not have to have a PayPal account. So going up to the top, I really want everyone to register. So encourage people to register because from now on, I am using the, um, this is going to be where I'm building my campaigns from. I'm going to be canceling um, MailChimp. And then we come to prayers. Now, resources for prayers. I've got the strategy for using Silence the Accuser. We've got recommended books for your growth. Um, Valerie and I spent a lot of time pulling together this reading list. For those of you who've had trouble with the confidential consent form, it's here for download. And then there's replacing the false verdicts of Freemasonry with scriptures. That's what's available on this page of prayers. And then it gets into basic prayers. This is the very beginnings of um, Silence the Accuser. The very most important thing is confession and faith in Jesus Christ. Then the preparation prayer for court, the dismantling the strong man of religion, command the morning, and the proclamation of covenant, and then the sealing prayer. They're all here. They're all available for you to use. You can download them. You can share them with your, with your home groups, your prayer groups. Um, then the last one is the sum of the silence, the accuser prayers, the ones I consider most important. So under videos. We've got Silence the Accuser to start, the very basic ones. Then if the next page is more silencing the accuser vi videos. Then Lifestyle of Intercession with the, with the links for the um, outlines. And the last is the Mercy Courts. So this is where your Mercy Courts are going to be posted. They will, I will upload them to YouTube. And then I'm going to post them here to Mercy Court Training, and you can find what you need here. Now, as we continue through here, um, under Updates, this is all the information for Mercy Court. So if you have a friend who's wanting to be involved in the Mercy Court, just tell them to go to God's Foundation Builders. Under Updates, they'll get all the links that they need to enter in. Testimonies are exactly that. They're testimonies from people who have written us. They're just a small fraction of the people that have met, written us. Then blog. 
Now, there's two things I have under blog. One is the prophetic understanding of abortion. My mother was a, an, an intercessor for abortion who received incredible prophetic words. These are her prophetic words. If you want to be utterly shattered by the reality of what abortion does to a person and what it does to a nation, read this blog. Then the rest filled Faith Rest Life <coughs> is a prophetic message by a friend of mine. And the other day, I took that Faith Rest Life message and I applied it to my life as I was going to sleep. And I was amazed at how I was able to bring the life of God into my body and have so many pains and that which was disrupting me physically just utterly be washed away. Um, then there is a higher courts page, and this one is only for those people who are participating, that limited group that I'm working with at this time. But when you get to the place where I sense that you're ready to, to be, I will send you an invite to this particular page on my website. Getting back to videos, I'm going back to the Mercy Court. So we come down. I have not posted any um, any of our discussion groups. Mainly, it's because I don't want to in any way cause difficulty with your life. Down at the bottom here is what we're going to be talking about today. So if you want to open that up on your phone or on your um, but I'll have a larger one that will be available. So I'm going to end share at the moment. Okay, I'm back. All right, we're ready to begin. And I want to welcome each and every person that's here. Um, this has been a very intense time for me. We came back yesterday about four from down, being down at the Georgia Revival. This was the second time that I went. Um, I was traveling with Valerie and a dear friend, Robin McGuire. And our entire time in the car, we were just moving down there, listening to incredible worship music by Jill Shannon. The album is called Eternity. And then we, we went into court, and I believe we're going to be doing that court today. I don't know if I haven't gotten release yet on that. I'll see as we continue to travel. But the three of us, from the moment we stood at the door waiting for entrance into Christ Fellowship in Dawsonville, Georgia, literally the ground was vibrating up into us. By the time I was baptized, it was over my head. During the service, most of it, I was truly slain in the spirit. And the only time I've had that happen is when I received the call to, to be an intercession assessor in 1982. So this, I know it was very significant what happened in Dawsonville, Georgia. So I'm going to begin with a prayer. Father, I bring each person who's, who's present this day and everyone who will ever watch by YouTube, by video, into your presence this day. Father, I ask that they have ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart of understanding. I'm asking for the seven spirits of God to be with us, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. With the spirit of the Lord, Father, I am asking that Jesus, that the very life of God be in this these videos, in these teachings, and that everyone who hears these teachings enter into deeper and deeper life, eternal life, the, higher, the highest life of heaven. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. All right, today we're going to be talking about the profane worship. It is a major um, difficulty for each one of you. Oh, let me see if I can do this. Okay. Oh, Jesus, help me. Okay. Slideshow, start. Okay.
Okay, let me get into this. What I have here, I think most of you can see it, is a, a picture. It's kind of a timeline the Lord has given me to understand how all of this has been coming about through the ages, how the profane worship is impacting us. Notice from the time of Genesis 1 through Genesis 3, how the bloodlines start going up through to the modern age. And we've got, first we have at the very, very, very bottom of this, we have Ezekiel 28. In Ezekiel 28, it describes how, and we should all go there. So let's go to Ezekiel 28. And this is a description starting at Ezekiel 28, 12. This is a description about Lucifer and the fall of Lucifer. So it's very important that we recognize everything about Lucifer to understand what happened. And he was blameless in his ways until iniquity and guilt was found in him. Now how iniquity, that's a mystery of iniquity, how it was found in Lucifer, I have no idea. But through the abundance of your commerce or through your trade, now, trade, the use of the word trade here is the very first time it is used in Scripture. And, and it's the only time it's used in this particular chapter of Scripture, that Hebrew word trade. This is very, very important. This is the beginning of the trading floors with darkness. So it's through the abundance of your trade, you were filled with lawlessness and violence and I cast you out as a profane thing from the mountain of God. I drove you out from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud and lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. So he was basically, he was incredibly beautiful, if you read the description of all the stones. And it's basically, he was, he was absolutely full measure and pattern of completeness. He was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now you have to see this archangel. See him. He's walking among this Eden. He's in Eden, the garden of God. And all these precious stones are on him. And he's walking among the stones of the, of the, the fiery stones of the mountain of God. And that fire from the stones, which is the reflected glory of God, he begins to see this incredible reflection coming off the stones that make up him and the gold. And he's, he sees his glory, not recognizing he's created. He is only reflecting the creator, the glory and the light of Almighty God. And then because of this, his heart was proud and lifted up and he cast them to the ground. You have profaned your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquity and by the enormity of your guilt, by the unrighteousness of your trained. That's why I have down here the profane sanctuary. I, I have a, a Bible by Dakes. It's called the Dakes Bible. And he goes into an amazing um, Bible study about pre-Adamic civilization. And he tracks it incredibly, and he shows that in Genesis 1, it was truly a recreation because when God, when the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters, the earth was filled with chaos and was void. God never creates anything that would be chaos and void. Between the profane sanctuaries in Genesis 1, there is an, a judgment that comes upon the earth because of what Lucifer did and with this unrighteous trade that he had with the pre-Adamic race. Now, this, would, this explains, you know, the bones they find, and they use the bones to discount the Bible. So it's important that we enlarge our thinking. God never expects us to take our brains and to set it on the shelf 
And when there is empirical evidence, we just go, no, no, no. The earth was created 6,000 years ago. No, the earth was recreated. And God at that time created man in his image, Genesis 1. We know what happened in Genesis 3. This is the fall of man. And in the fall of man, Eve chose to eat from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And remember last week, I talked about how this tree was so beautiful. It was glittering. The, the fruit looked, it was like this wondrous glittering gems. There was all this light, false light, black light emanating from it. And the tree of life was a very simple tree. It represents Jesus. And instead they chose Genesis 3, which was the beginning of the curse of man. And the curse of man continues with two bloodlines, the bloodline of Seth coming out of Adam and the bloodline of Cain until we get to Genesis. And in Genesis 6, we know that at that time, the sons of man, the sons of God, which is the B'nai Elohim, literally sons of God, looked upon the daughters of Adam, saw that they were beautiful, and took them and seized them to be their wives. Now, this was a seizing. This was not just a um, seduction. They literally took them. Out of this, we know we have the Nephilim, which are translated giants, and that are also translated, um, what do you call it? the mighty men of old, mighty men of valor. The other term that they use for that particular one is the fact that they were men of renown and fame. Now, I want you to think back, you know, look at this modern age, look at the reality that, um, oh, let me get this right, Lord, please. The reality that exploding on our in our, in our world right now, is all of these movies. In a, it's about these men and women who have superpowers. Where did the superpowers come from? They came from another dimension. They're, these superpowers truly are reflections of the Nephilim of Genesis 6. If you look at all the myths throughout the world, there's always these men and women with superpowers, and they war against each other. I remember when I was in India, they said in India that Delhi was formed by a semi-divine family. Well, semi-divine would be a mixture of Adams, sons of Adam, and the sons of God. And if you go through all of the different cultures, there's these men and women with supernatural powers that they're getting through the, through the bloodline. They're getting through the occult. Because you know, when the... Nephilim and the fallen sons of God came to the earth, they were introducing man to high level occult knowledge in the dimensions. And this is just really, really important that we understand this. And now because it's corrupting the DNA, they were corrupting the DNA, not only of man, but they began corrupting the DNA of the animal kingdom of birds and of fish. There was this incredible corruption. They wanted to utter, utterly corrupt. The plan was to utterly destroy the beauty of God's creation. Fast forward to our society today. Our scientists are playing with, literally, they're playing with the, um, the manipulation of DNA, and they are creating Shimura once again. It's for the corruption of the DNA of creation that God created it. So then we have the flood, and only know what was seen to be perfect in his generations. It means his DNA was perfect. And after we get the post-flood, in the post-flood, um, when Adam, Adam landed on, on, on Mount Arafat in oh. Turkey, Noah. Noah. Noah landed on Mount Arafat in Turkey. And it's very interesting from there. It's not that far down that you get to Babylon, where Nimrod, one of the sons of Ham, um, established the Tower of Babel. Now, 
the Tower of Babel was the per- for the purpose. They, it was that same corruption that's coming in, that same seduction, the seduction of the bloodlines. And there, they wanted to build a tower to the heavens. They wanted to become as God. They wanted access to the dimensions. And God saw it. And he said, anything they choose to do, it will, because they're in agreement. And that's the power of agreement. Anything they touch in agreement, it shall happen. So we must divide the tongues. And with that, he utterly scattered them to the nations. And then it, at that time also, there is the dividing of the continents. This is how Babylon, the gods of Babylon, are the foundation for all the gods throughout the world. They just have a different names, different titles, but the gods are the same. The three gods of Babylon are Baal, Ceneramus, Queen of Heaven, and Talmos, which is her son. And if you go into any of the mythology of the nations, you're going to find a similar pattern where there is the chief god, the head father god, there's queen of heaven, and then a son that is miraculously conceived. Now, that's why you have all these empires. It doesn't matter what the empire it is. It can be the, the we have the Egyptian empire, we've got the Roman empire, we've got the Persian empire, we've got the Greek empire, whatever the empire is in whatever part of the world. These are all happening and then we get the birth of the church. Then Jesus Christ comes and he's providing a way of escape for man through his shed blood, through the crucifixion, through the Holy Spirit. Now in the birth of the church, there's something we must understand. And I just recently realized this as I was reading a book. The church was birthed perfectly. The apostles, the epistles, the New Testament was totally knit with the Old Testament because everything about the early apostles, there wasn't a separation in their understandings from the books of the law, the Psalms, from the prophets, from the history. It was all understood. And yet in the second century, as men became saved, and there were some Greek men that were saved, there were disciples of Plato and Socrates. And they wrote, but they wrote from a Greek mindset. And the Greek mindset, which is still influencing the church today and probably influences you, is that we are only body and soul. The early church understood that we were body, soul, and spirit. So in this second century, because the men of God were busy about the work of establishing the church and going to the world, going to the nations, and doing the Great Commission, the only writings that remained at that time were by these Greek disciples of Plato and Socrates, who wrote their understandings out of a Greek mindset. And then it began, this book I was reading, it began to show how all of the early church fathers were influenced by Greece, not by the Hebraic mindset. And so it was always about the body and the soul, right up to the time of Augustine, right up to the time of St. Thomas Aquinas. There was one man, Dionysius, from the, they call him Dionysius the Fraud. He presented his writings as if he had been trained by Paul and as if he had trained Timothy. St. Thomas Aquinas, who's considered the theo- theologian for both the Catholic and the Protestant church, quotes him 100 times in his manuscripts that is the foundation. And it was proved that this man was a fraud and he lived in the fifth century. So when you look at church steeples and you look at stained glass and these massive buildings, we can thank Dionysius for this being brought into the church. So then we come to Martin Luther King and he wrote also. He wrote and he was totally influenced by the intellect. So out of all of this, coming from the second century, the intellect of man became the way that you reach God. So look at the seminaries, look at the universities, look at the men and women 
who pursue doctorate degrees and education, and they, they're on this pursuit of knowledge of God. But you can pursue knowledge of God, and if you're not pursuing it by the Spirit of God, it is just emptiness, utter emptiness. And this is what has been happening through the church age, all the ages of the church. Now mix into this, starting with um, Constantine. He decreed that the Roman Empire was Christian. Everybody in the Roman Empire was Christian. This is what we call force, forced conversions. This is, it is not a heart conversion. This is not coming out of, I really know and accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. This is coming out of just an identity. I'm a Ro Roman citizen, therefore I am a Christian. Out of forced conversion comes what we call syncretism. Syncretism is when I take everything from the idolatry, my gods, and give them the names of saints. Even the practice of Christmas and Easter is coming out of syncretism, out of Roman syncretism. Then if you go into the, um, the Spanish invasion of um, Mexico, Central America, South America, it was forced to convert conversions of the native Indians of all the natives. So tremendous syncretism was released. Now I want you to notice through the bloodlines, those black dots I'm calling keepers of the flame. These are through the generations. Added to this now, from probably the 15th, 16th century, we've got Freemasonry. Now with the Freemasonry, we have this, this is working with the keepers of the flame. These are individuals and in family lines that have developed occult anointings that know how to enter into the dimensions and they pass it from generation to generation. They look to see who in their, in their bloodline is worthy of carrying the flame. We take it all the way to modern age, the eruption of the cult in society. And we're seeing this incredible, people are blatant about their occult practices. So I wanted to show you this because I think it's important to understand this in terms of our own life, in terms of um, profane worship. Okay, so profane worship is at the foundation of everything that we're fighting against. And we're firing, fighting against the layering through the nations of our bloodlines. So it's so people, they think, you know, when I get an email and someone will say to me, well, I've completed the book and now everything is done. And I think, oh my God, we, as we start this and we go in and we do the profane worship and we repent in the mercy court for this, we have to see it. We have to go back to the roots of this but we're going back to the roots of this in our mother and father's lines, in any adopted lines. So we have to see that this is very deep, and this requires us to really, really see it and understand it. What we know about profane worship and what the Lord has shown me very, very clearly is there's three aspects to profane worship. There is blood sacrifice. And if you, the highest form of gaining power is the sacrifice of a baby, the sacrifice of a virgin male and virgin female maiden and lad. This is the highest form. This is why in the Old Testament, they they burnt the babies. I think it was to Marduk. So there was always these offerings, these offerings. Abortion today is giving offerings to Baal. Baal always requires blood, always requires blood. So in your bloodline, if you look at your family history and you see early deaths, you see accidents, you see miscarriages and the loss of children, if you see strange illnesses that take the family, a family member quickly, recognize that this is still the profane worship in the generations that is requiring a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice 
from that family line. This is critically important to understand, to look at it and to recognize, yes, we were involved in blood sacrifices. And knowing that and seeing that and then seeing it through the eyes of God and seeing the consequences, the consequences of this iniquity. Avon means the iniquity, but it also means the consequences, the punishment for the iniquity. So then we also have to look at the sexual perversion that was always a part of profane worship. The defilement of the person, the defilement of purity. And so when we look at this, we have to really say to ourselves, if we see sexual perversion rampant in our bloodline, we have to look at that and say, okay, this is going back to the original sexual perversion of the, um, the temple prostitution, the sodomites of the temple that my family was involved with. And in some cases, they, they gave, they placed their, their sperm on the altar and dedicated their sperm, their lineage to darkness. We are still bearing the consequences of the actions of our forefathers, of our bloodline. It's in our DNA. And then we've got to look. The other thing they always did is they used drums, vibration, music, and drugs to enter the dimensions of darkness. There's always this pursuit of power. There's always this pursuit of the hidden mysteries of darkness. There's a fascination. There is a fat, and if you have ever had any fascination with the occult, Ouija boards, crystal balls, wanting to know the future, you need to recognize that that is in your DNA. If you were drawn into witchcraft, if you were drawn into seances, um, necromancy, any of this, you have to see that is coming out of the original profane worship in your bloodline. So we're dealing in our time with the consequences of the profane worship, but we don't see it as consequences. In the profane worship, they gave sacrifices. They gave offerings to those gods. They made dedication and covenants with these gods through the blood sacrifices, basically giving the gods control of the bloodlines, ownership of the bloodlines. And we know that the kingdom of darkness, Satan is a legalist, and he looks in the books of hell, and he says, oh, I have ownership of this family. I know that they've received, this person's received Christ, but they really don't know how to appropriate freedom from my ownership. So this is what we have to do to appropriate freedom. It really is in 2 Colossians 14, where it talks about For you were dead in your trespasses at 13, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, your carnal nature. Your carnal nature is rooted in the fallen nature of man. It's rooted in the fallen DNA that each of us carries from Adam. This is, you know, we don't come, you know, being Americans, we, we're so independent. We, we see ourselves as separate from our ancestors. We're our own man or woman. We're independent. We're self-sufficient. That doesn't impact me what they did. This is just a lie from the pit of hell. It's really a lie. You were brought to life with Christ, having freely forgiven us all our transgressions. We know with Isaiah 53, he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquity. And the chastisement for our peace fell upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. And this is the most important scripture. And you need to see this. You need to understand this. You need to see it when you do your profane worship. Having cancels and blight blotted out and wiped away the handwriting of the note. The note. There is an ownership 
note over your life. With all its legal decrees and demands, which was in force and stood against us, which was hostile to us, the note with all of its regulations, all of its decrees, all of its demands for service, the note that is in the book of hell that was signed by our ancestors in their acts of profane worship, and it was signed generation after generation after generation. The different parts of our, our DNA, they signed the note. They gave the bloodline. They reinforced this ownership of hell. This note, with all its reg regulations, decrees, and demands, he, Jesus Christ, set aside and completed cleared completely out of the way by nailing it to his cross. Now, when we're doing the profane worship, when we're really doing it and seeing it through the generations, seeing it through the eyes of God, seeing the captivity of our families through Freemasonry, where it's reinforced, through all of the different um, gods that were worshipped. I mean, you go back to the very beginning. You know, I've got German. I've got Druid. I don't even know all the gods in my bloodline that were worshipped, but I know they were because it's coming through my mother and father's lineage and through the adopted side. I've got Scandinavian. I've got Italian and Greece. I've got so many. I've got Nigerian. I've got Portuguese, whatever they were doing there. I don't even know. But I really, really have to see it in the spirit and recognize that a way of escape was made for us as we do the confession of profane worship, as we do the renunciation of the covenants of darkness. And when you're doing the renunciation of the covenants of darkness, you've got to picture in your mind going back generation, millennia, you know, like century by century by century by century going back to the time of Noah and asking forgiveness, just asking forgiveness, asking forgiveness, saying, I am renouncing every covenant, and then seeing it nailed to the cross with all the demands for service. We have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness. We have been utterly, utterly into the kingdom of the son of love. And so many of you are not experiencing the kingdom of the son of love because those names, those demands, those notes against you, right down to the witchcraft the going on in your family, in this generation, in the last generations, and all the Masonic, you've got to see it as utterly being nailed to the cross, and that you are free, and your bloodline, your children are free from the demands for service. You are utterly, utterly free. So my homework for each one of you this week is that you're going to go back, and you're going to redo profane worship. The whole the whole, however many prayers there are to do it. If anyone's watching this and they don't have the book, it's under prayers on the website, godsfoundationbuilders.com. And do this, do this with such sincerity and tears in the mercy court. Do this. And next week, I am going to take you all to a, the court of divorce, and we're going to divorce you from the elders in your bloodline so that you are free from their voices, you are free from their influence, that you can stand as a child of God in his presence, and that those voices, those, those internal voices that tell you you're not good enough or you're never going to be free, all of that, all those lies that you can be free of those lies. And if you've been personally involved in the court and in the occult, in any kind of covens, in any kind of witchcraft, go in and do a very, very deep repentance.
The other thing I need you to see is because there were these keepers of the flame, there is anointings on bloodlines. And this anointing on the bloodlines, it comes through to this generation. And we get spirit-filled, and we have these incredible anointings that are very, very powerful. And people are drawn to us because of the anointing. But this anointing is truly anointing of darkness. It's drawing on that which is in the generations. And you have to take that prayer for the release of the anointing of darkness and really strip yourself of that. And you need to strip yourself of all the inheritance of darkness. You need to see, look at yourself in the spirit and look at the tattoos and cuttings that are on your soul that are on your emotions, that are on your will, that are keeping you in captivity. Because that tattoo, whatever it is, that cutting is holding. It's a mark to the spirit realm that you belong to them. So we've got to be totally free. And I just thank you that for your willingness to press. This is a journey. It is not a one-time prayer. I have done the profane worship over the years so many times. And when I do it now, there is such an anointing on what I do. But this is something you have to do if you want freedom for yourself and your family. So I bless you. I bless you. I bless you. I bless you with the courage to persevere. I bless you with the strength to look and to see. And I bless you with knowing that when the leper went to Jesus, he said, Jesus, son of David, heal me if you want to. And Jesus says, of course I want to. And this profane wor worship causes leprosy in our souls. It's the root of the drug abuse. It's the root of the sexual perversion. And if we're going to get our families free from all of this fruit in our generations, we have to go deeper. So I thank you, God, Father God, for everyone who hears this and how they will choose, make a flinty face decision to go deeper. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent teaching today as well. One of my questions had to do with um, Molech. I was always, um, I hear Baal sometime when we're talking about innocent blood, when we're talking about offerings to babies. So many times I've heard Molech as opposed to Baal, and sometimes I've heard Baal. Okay. But I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with the three, and I was just wondering what your take was on that. And then I noticed you didn't mention the pharmacia when entering into, and I thought you were going to mention that when you mentioned the drums and the vibration and the music. Well, and if I missed thing, it, I meant to. It's the drugs that take us in. Yeah. Okay, good. And the last thing was regarding, you know, with uh, the, the people that I work with and the tattoos that many times have been placed on them physically. I was wondering what your take was on that. Thank you. Well, Peter. I definitely, if someone's born again and they had a tattoo, Tattoo and the cutting, if you go into the Old Testament, it very clearly bans cuttings and tattoos because God knew. So I would, because we live under grace, I would cover all tattoos in the blood of Jesus so that the markings, we have to do it in the spirit. It's the spirit and the spirits behind it okay. that we have to deal with. Sometimes There's, you can change the tattoo. Um, sometimes they can be erased. It depends on how vile they are. Um, I know when I was working in California and teaching in Mexico, I was down in, um, let's see, down at the border. It's the border, Dan, the border city? Tijuana. Tijuana. And the um, Mexican um, gangs, they were getting the gods of Mexico tattooed on their chests. They were very aware of whose power they were calling on. In terms of Moloch, I want you to go back to when I was talking about Babylon and the scattering of the nations. They took the basic three, three gods. They're the heads. So Moloch is just another name for Baal, okay? Another okay. manifestation in a much deeper age, much further 
um, into history. Then ba Babel in Babylon was the very first one. The Lord told us when we were in Turkey, that was the foundation of all the gods. And when we were dealing with the gods, all we had to do was deal with those top three. Because everything else comes off of that. Okay? Thank you so much. Okay. Next. All right. So I'm going to unmute. I'm going to. Next. Um, I had a question. Um, I was wondering if you could clarify by going deeper into repentance for profane worship, what prayers are you referring to? Um, the prayers I'm referring to are the prayers in the book. There's a whole section on profane worship. I put most of those prayers, but not all of the prayers, are on the website. So if you have the book, you go to profane worship and you start working through that. That's what you have to do. Okay, I'm going to um, bun me. Okay. I'm going to allow you to talk. Okay, you can ask your question, Bunmi. Hi, Jackie. It's Boomi. Yeah, oh, it's, uh, I'm sorry. No worries at all. Um, I wanted, uh, the other day, I was asking the Lord about the link between uh, sugar, sugar addiction, and what I sensed, my best sense of what uh, he said was Asherah pole, uh, Asherah pole and dedication. Okay. I can't put, you know, I, I can't really put, uh, I don't understand why sugar addiction has anything to do with Asherah poles. I checked the Bible. It talked about cakes being given to uh, Asherah. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could um, give me one or two. Okay. When you look at Asherah, Asherah was the fertility pole. Yes. Okay. And it's queen of heaven they gave the cakes to. So addictions, addictions in any way. Gluttony, sugar addictions, any addictions that control your life are going to becoming the root foundation. Because when they did these Asherah poles, they would literally go and lay under the trees and have sexual orgies. The, the Asherah pole itself is like the um, obelisk. When you see an obelisk, when you see these images, and I'll, I'll be very frank here, of a penis, because that's yeah. what an obelisk is. That's why Freemasonry uses it. They literally, they have the obelisk, and then they will have a dome. And the dome is like, think of it as like the, the womb or the vagina of Ceneramus. The obelisk is, the, is Baal, or the, you know, whatever you want to call that chief god. And so there's, in Egypt, in Egypt mythology, it's all there. In our very capital, that's why we have the largest obelisk in the world. And just down from it is the Capitol building with the dome. And when a president is being inaugurated, there are seek, there's a secret room under the obelisk. And the Freemason leadership, the Illuminati, is there doing all kinds of calling for what they want for this new world order. So those images... Anything that takes us into captivity is coming out of this profane worship. Does thank that you. make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right. Any other question? I'll put your hands on and put your hands up. Any questions? I've got a lot of you. Okay. Jake, I'm going to allow you to talk. Okay. Hey Jackie, you mentioned uh, three aspects of profane worship, uh, and the first one that you said was blood sacrifice, uh, right. uh, sexual perversion. What was the third one? I, I the think third I one is using pharmacia and drugs and vibrations and light. See, yeah. you've got to use drugs. What drugs does is it takes you into a different dimension. It takes you into a dimension that is controlled by darkness. If you look at many movies and TV shows right now, they're showing people entering into those dimensions as if this is something to be pursued. So they use drugs. Every, they used, I, who knows what drugs they used, but they used drugs. So drug use and drug abuse is the way that people are drawn into different dimensions. And they're drawn into a different world that is very unhealthy for their body, soul, and spirit. Okay? Make okay. sense? 
Yes. Okay, I'll mute you. Any other question? Lisa, is your hand up again? Please lower your hand if you're not. Um, Lisa? Okay, let's see your hand didn't come down. I'm going to unmute you again. Do you have another question? Yes, please. Okay. I had an experience um, in the courts yesterday where the judge stood up, and I was just wondering if that ever happened, what that was, that was something. Yeah, when it's serious, the judge will stand up and make a difference. Oh. That's a real good sign when the judge stands up. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That, that. It's like, the case is finished. I'm going to make my decree. <laughs> I'm pleased. Okay. Yeah, it's really good. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Lower your hand. Okay, Jake, do you want another question? Okay. Okay, Jake, do you have another question? Yes, yes, I have another question. So um, you mentioned uh, pharmacia, drugs, and light. Is there also a third dimension to do with sound? Of course, I mentioned sounds, vibrations. Vibrations. That drums. Um, that's why I can remember years ago, um, I was on vacation from, I was like a junior in college and I was visiting friends who were working up in Lake Placid and we went to a you know like a dance place with with the lights and all the strobe lights and all the noise in the in the songs and I became very aware I I hated the experience because I knew those lights were doing something to me and the noise, the sound, the drug beat, drum beats, that I, I just had to get out of there. I did not enjoy it at all. Okay? Okay. okay. So, yes, noise, drum vibrations, vibrations. Okay. Um, so I'm going to mute, mute Jake. Okay, you're going to be muted. Um, Bumi, you're, Bunmi? Yes. You're um, wanting to speak again? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, what's the link uh, between autism? Is it linked to the GMO foods we're eating, uh, or is it a direct link with profane worship? I don't have an answer on that. I think there's many different causes. Um, I know in if you read my book or watch my video, there's the story about um, Oliver Wade. And I prayed with his wife, Jackie. We began praying in 1982, and we did not receive the insight into iniquity until 1988. But I would meet with her almost weekly. Her husband was um, paranoid schizophrenic. He had had many breakdowns. I remember. His, his sister's paranoid schizophrenic. And his, the what was holding... Him, his family in captivity. That's what I mean. You've got to go to the root. You can only get to the root by prayer and fasting and asking the Lord to show you. Okay? I can't do that for you. This is, this is your journey. This is your deer trail. So with him, there were two things that were happening. There was the murder of the eldest son of his father. He was released by the courts, not guilty because his father was known for being so cruel. He was known for being as cruel to his slaves as he was to his family. And the other thing that was going on there is this man was a slaveholder. And if you look at generational enemies, we know a curse without cause cannot come. But if he was cruel to his family, he was cruel to his slaves, and those curses of the slaves, now they're, they know roots, they know African cursing, can come against this family. And we had to deal with all of that for Oliver to be set free. Now, he never was able to go off his medications, but he did come into his right mind in the last years of his life, and he never had another, um, another schizophrenic break, which was, and Jackie said, this is the man I married. 
Now, the most amazing part of his of their story, she has four sons. They're all married. She has 14 grandchildren. She has, I can't even keep count of the number of great-grands. There is no mental illness any longer on the family. Now, her nieces and nephews, her, from another, from his sister, where the son was paranoid, the, the sister was, his sister was okay, but her son was paranoid schizophrenic, and they had in that family a midget. So they called Aunt Jackie and they said, when you did the work for Oliver, going back into the generations, did that cover us? And of course it does. The deeper you go into the generations with your repentance before the Lord, everyone related to you from that point on is being set free. This is a form of deliverance. This is a form of intercession for nations. Okay, does that answer your question, Bunmi? Yes, yes, it does. Okay, Bumi. Okay, I'm going to mute you. Um, I'm going to go to Lindsay, allow to talk. Okay. Okay. Speak up, Lindsay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more into the anointings of darkness, uh, particularly on believers, and how do we discern between unusual moves of the spirit versus witchcraft that's happening in the church. Um, we're seeing a lot coming out now with, you see it on YouTube, people speaking out against certain churches, certain uh, movements, certain leaders. And I'm, I'm really seeking the Lord on this because I don't want to quench the spirit, but I also want to be very discerning when we're seeing something that's not of the Lord. So do you have any advice on that? Yes, I do. Okay, I'm basically talking about individuals, but it could also be an individual that is leading a church, okay? The, one of the things I've noticed with the people that I have come in contact with that, that had this issue is when someone always knows what the Spirit of God is saying, when someone always can see, when someone is so anointed that they draw to themselves, now hear carefully, to themselves, almost like disciples who follow them because they want to be around that anointing. They want to be with that knowing one. Now, according to 1 Corinthians 12, it tells us the Holy Spirit gives this gifts as the Spirit wills, not as we will. So when I get around someone who always, and I'm talking always knows, always sees, I get uncomfortable. So I basically say, okay, Lord, show me, what are they operating out of? And how are they guarding their gift? And have they cleansed their gift? Now, I had a situation years ago, and I was in a church, and it was an uh, inner city black church. The Lord told me to go there. He was very specific in wanting me there. So I went. And the apostle of this church was a man who was out of Nigeria, a very famous man. Um, if I said his name, you would know him. And as I was driving to church that day, that night, he was coming in. And I was so excited that he was the apostle of the church. And when I was driving there that night, the Lord said, cover yourself body, soul, and spirit in the blood of Jesus, because I'm going to show you spiritual prefer perversion tonight. Now, no one else went into those meetings doing that, and I want to really tell you that. So I went in, we went into, this church had wonderful worship and praise, and we did the wonderful worship when we praised, and the Spirit of God was present among us, and the pastor comes out and he says, the pastor and this apostle come out. And he said, the presence of God has just entered the room. Well, I'm sorry, the presence of God was there before they deigned to come out into the worship. It was, they did not bring it. it. We had brought it in through our heartfelt worship and praise. Then the apostle stood up. And this is where the spiritual perversion started. He made an announcement to the sound booth, 
to turn off the recording. Red flag. The first red flag was the presence of God. Red flag. And he turned, after he knew that they weren't recording, he loosed the worst curse on anyone who in any way spoke anything about this church. As he's speaking, I'm hearing in my spirit, man, you shall bless and not curse. He basically loosed this curse that said anyone that stood against this church, that they would die and their bodies would not, would be not even be claimed by their families, and they would be buried in like a potter's field. Now then, now he calls for people. He had told them, and I didn't know about this. I apparently didn't go the night before, that they were to bring gallons of oil. And this was going to be miracle oils. So he calls everybody up, and he's going to bless the miracle oil. And I'm seeing friends of mine just flooding the altar. And I got up and I walked out of that church and I called my brother-in-law and I told him what I saw. And he said, Jackie, flee to someplace safe. And I went to another church. We wrote a very simple reason, you know, why we left. That man, that apostle was dead in six months. He was operating out of anointing of darkness. His gifting his gifting was polluted. So my way of dealing with manifestations I'm not used to or whatever, I just always ask the Holy Spirit, is this you? And he'll say yes, and he'll say no. And I trust him with what he tells me. And if I have a check on something, I just don't engage with that. So I'm very, very careful about who I listen to what I listen to, um, I am not one that is engaged in like the ascension groups. I'm, I'm going to heaven by myself. I don't need anyone to help me. I just know, I just have to know that this is my habitation, that the highest life lives in me. And this is where we are seated in heavenly realms. It's just a stepping in. It's not that I need someone else to take me. And it's very, very important that we don't enter into dimensions that we're not supposed to go to. Very, very important. Okay, Lindsay, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. And you also brought to my, uh, it reminded me of the self-focus being wrong because uh, the Lord was showing me a couple months ago how that, that's like where astrology is rooted and all these quizzes that are so popular now. It's all about me, me, me. And even this Enneagram thing that's very popular in the Christian church, it's all about me. And um, it, at that I found was rooted in secret society. So anyway, that's really interesting, but that self-focus really seems to be key. So thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, I'm going to mute you. Okay, Joanne, I'm going to allow you to talk. Okay. Okay. Hi. So now I have two questions. I don't know which one I should go first with. You just mentioned not going to other dimensions, but um, do you hear me? Yeah, I'm hearing you. Okay. It, it, um, something that I noticed for a while now that um, uh, I am not personally going to other dimensions, but I feel in the, at nighttime that my body has, has gone, has gone away. It's coming back. I always, uh, at least four times, I felt my body come back into my myself. I, I have no recollection. Okay, what I would, that to me tells me that either you've been involved in satanic ritual abuse, or you've been in, in your generations, they have been involved in heavy occult. And so the enemy has a real ownership claim on you that you need to deal with. Okay? that we do not, we do not leave our bodies. So is there any part in the book that I should read? It's called Profane Worship. I've been telling you that. The whole book you have to work, Joanne. This is not, this is a journey. This is not anything. But you really, really have to watch the videos, engage in the court cases I do, pray the prayers, you know, call on the blood of Jesus to protect you at night. 
Okay, you've got to do some work. You've but got. I am doing work. I just can't do everything. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, Hania, I'm going to allow you to talk. I'm going to unmute you. Okay, I keep on trying. Okay, okay. Hania, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, thank you so much, Jackie. I just have um, a little question uh, in a, uh, as a practical way. Uh, we were talking about sugar and drugs. I was wondering, what do you think for those people who, who, who got diabetes type 1, for example, and they have to eat a lot of sugar in order to not go into coma? And also those who are, um, have so much uh, uh, diseases that have to take tablets after tablets. Do you think it would help to pray for them and go to deeper root uh, uh, to um, rep re repentance about uh, uh, profane worship? Renouncing the gods and so and so? I... In terms of someone needing sugar for sugar diabetes and they've got to eat some sugar, they're going to go into a diabetic coma. Of course they eat sugar. Of course they have to eat sugar. That's not the yeah. issue. We're yeah. talking about addictions. Okay. Addictions are different. Hmm. Diseases is all consequences of the fall. Okay? Okay. Just like the man with paranoid schizophrenia, we had to get to the place of finding the root cause for the paranoid schizophrenia that was decimating his family for four generations. So I think that's important to understand, okay? okay. Everything is prayer and fasting, seeking the Lord, and let, letting him show us what we need to do, okay? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, any other questions? Take your hand down, Hanai. Okay. All right, Uduko. I'm allowing you to talk. Okay, Uduko. Are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, hi. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, going back to the person. Who Closer, was... you're, we can't, you're whispering almost. Can you hear me now? Stay real close to your mic. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, better. Okay. Talking about um, uh, the person who was um, who had paranoid schizophrenia, and you found that one of his his ancestors was a slave. Um, no, not a slave. Slave, a slave owner. owner. Yes. Yeah. So I'm wondering for some of us who are on the other side of that um, trade in, in slaves, whose ancestors were slave sellers, dealers, is, are the prayers the same or are, is it, or are there different prayers we need to pray in that context? I think, you know, where it goes into generational enemies, the oppressed and the victim, it's going as an oppressor. You take the prayer of the oppressor and you kind of work it specifically in terms of the damage that was done to the people that were traded and the greed that caused this to be ongoing. I don't know if it went on for generations, but all of the people that were traded would have a legal right to curse your family. And so there would be a layering of curses through the generations. A curse without cause cannot come, but this is an example of a curse with cause, okay? It says Jesus became a curse to free us from the curse of the law. But he doesn't say he frees us from the curse of our enemies. So we have to really, a curse cannot light unless there is cause for the curse to come. <clears throat> so you have to take that prayer and you have to really, really look at it. And you have to almost rewrite it in your mind, spring for, springboard it, especially for people who are slave traders and who profited from the labor and from the sale of an individual okay that would be a heavy curse on your family it really would be anything else uduko no that's fine thank you thank you okay any other questions okay i'm looking for hands up 
All right. Any other hands up? Okay. Um, Jake again? Okay, I'll unmute you. Okay, Jake. Can you tell us a little bit more about the pre-Adamic uh, creation or give us uh, some resources? Well, the resource I gave you was Dake's Bible. Let me get a, show it to you, the cover. Okay. He was a Bible scholar. And in here, when he starts doing the pre-Adamic world, he basically takes you on a journey through Scripture showing all the places because remember it is the glory of a king to search something out and right. it is god hides it but it's the glory of kings to search out so i remember reading this and suddenly for me um so much made sense and i've had i had a situation it was and i've never understood it but i think i understand it better now than i did then Basically, we were um, praying over the earthquake fault lines in our region. And I was praying with a seer, and she saw all these midget people there. Hmm. And, and we were like, who are these, Lord? And I believe they were the souls of these pre this pre-Adamic race. So I always find that the Lord... Um, I'm looking for it. So, from the dateless past to the end of the seven days, I'm just reading from his Bible notes. Mm -hmm. The period may be called the anti, anti, I mean, before, anti, A N T E, chaotic mm -hmm. age, and the dispensation of angels because the angels were ruling various plant planets. Okay, so we've got to see it's the dateless past. And he's got, see pre-Adamic world, page 54. So, I mean, you can follow his notes and it's, it's very, very fascinating. But it makes sense to me because I always looked at Ezekiel 28 and I said, how did he profane the sanctuary? Then he was cast out and cast down. And so when I look at that, the profane sanctuaries, I see those sanctuaries is the high places in the earth, Kathmandu, Sedona, all these high places in the different nations of the earth. These were where there would have been sanctuaries. And he was ruling over the earth. He was in the Garden of Eden. He was walking on the stones of fire. He was leading the pre-Adamic race in worship to God. He was the anointed cherub of worship. But it was like, oh no, I don't want this to go to God. I'm going to ascend above the highest heaven. I'm going to put my seat above the throne, the stars. So we have to put everything, all of these clues that are in scripture, we bring them together. Would I would never expect anyone to believe this. You know, when I have a a Bible understanding that I receive, my salvation doesn't rise or fall on this truth. But what it does do is help me to understand how the earth was profaned, how Lucifer was already in the earth when the Garden of Eden was established, and he brought his tree into the earth. Remember, the charge to Adam is to take dominion over the earth. Well, what did he have to take dominion over? He had to keep and guard the garden. What did he have to guard it from if it wasn't from that pollution that was already in the earth? So that's really, really important that we see that. We understand that. And it just helps me. It helps, it gives me a grid. And this whole understanding of profane worship that I've been working with since 1999, the Lord just keeps on fine-tuning the grid of my understanding. I guess that's the best way to describe it. Does that make sense, Jake? 
Right, yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. So if you get the Dakes Bible, mm -hmm. and if you're a real Bible student, I would recommend it. Um, it's extremely small reading. I think the, the print is probably a nine or an eight, hard uh -huh. on the eyes, mm -hmm. but it's really, really valuable in terms of doing Bible study. Thank you. Thank you. Any other hands up? Okay, lots of them. Okay, Pat Patricia Prince, I'm going to allow you to talk. Okay. Patricia? Yes, I'm here. Okay. I wanted to find out about, um, oh, it just left me. <laughs> what about um, mind blankness, forgetfulness? What would that be? Well, I think it all goes back to a captivity. And when we have regions of captivity, there's different parts of our soul that can be taken captive. Um, our mind, our intellect is one of those, our will and our emotions. So again, it's seeking out why have I been taken captive? It can be, you know, we have to look at anything in our bloodline or in our own personal history. Use of drugs, involvement in witchcraft and occult practices. All of this would give the enemy the right to hold us into captivity. Okay? And addictions? Alcohol? Addictions? There's, when it comes to addictions, I always look at addictions in terms of looking for the root. Addictive behavior is rooted in the, in the DNA. There's something that happened in the DNA. It can be the trauma of war. It can be the trauma of having to be been ripped from your country, from your villages. It can be the trauma of having to, um, like with the Irish dysphoria, they had to leave Ireland to survive, but their hearts yearn. They grieve for the loss of their culture and their people. Now, my grandfather was an alcoholic. My uncles were alcoholics. My father made a very strong decision not to drink. We had my one uncle lived in our home when I was in high school. His presence as an alcoholic in our home, you know, imprinted on the family of six kids that we were not going to pursue alcohol. We saw the damage of it. So it's, but it's rooted in a trauma. It's rooted in a trauma of war. It's rooted in a trauma. And it can be a personal trauma that has happened to us that we're trying to escape the pain. Or it can be a generational trauma. But it's rooted somewhere. Okay? Yeah. And yeah. again, everything with roots, we fast, we pray, we seek, and we know it says, knock and just keep on knocking. Seek and keep on seeking. Find, and the door is going to be open to you. So the Lord requires of us that we be the seekers. That's why I don't do court cases for people. I do not want to stand as a Nicolaitan, a priest that separates you from your relationship with God. I want you to be the seeker. I want you to be the one that is knocking and asking and keep on asking from the Lord, knowing that he's going to answer you. But it is a journey. It's not, it's not McDonald's. It's not this idea that I do it once and it's finished. I had someone email me, you know, I did the profane worship prayer and now everyone in my family is free. I'm thinking, oh, that it would be so simple because I think what has to happen, the freedom comes is it drops down into our spirit, the reality of the cross, the reality of the cancellation of the notes, that we see it through the eyes of God. We have repented for it before God, seeing it as God sees it. That's what brings deliverance and freedom. Any other questions? Any other question on that? Nope. Okay, let's see. Um, Patricia, you're still allowed to talk. Um, that's it for now. Okay, thank you. Okay, anybody else? Any other hands up? Take your hand down, please, Patricia. Okay, Alex, I'm going to allow you to talk. Okay. 
Alex, you're unmuted. Alex? Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear Hello. you now. Thank you. Oh, sorry about that. Um, hi, Jackie. I'm seeking for my family's freedom. And um, Satan actually came to me and he said to me that I must absolve myself. Now, um, is it possible that you could tell me what are the consequences of me absolving myself? I have no idea what word you're using. Could you put it in chat, please? Um, I was, uh, uh, I'm seeking for my uh, family's freedom. We, I have, we got a lot of um, witchcraft texts on us, and I know there is an open door. Right. And um, I, also, I also know, uh, because I'm always dreaming that I'm serving people. So uh, I think that's probably something to do with my family being slaves to Satan. Um, that's what I understand. But now with me seeking for my freedom, it's like, it's like he, he, um, I had this vision um, just before I woke up one morning and were the words, absolve yourself. But it was not the Lord speaking. Right. It, 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 yeah, it was. A-B-S-O-L-V-E? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. So like, you move, like, yes. You need to look up what absolve means. Okay. Go deep um, into the meaning of absolve. Um, absolve, it, 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 it means that I need to like walk away from it. it, it he wants me to just um, not get rid of it, but walk away from it. Like, uh, he's um, really, he's take really myself said, out of Pardon? He's really saying to you that you need to walk away from Christ. You need to maintain your covenants with him. Uh, what I believe he's saying. So I would... I would just keep on pressing on that profane worship. Just keep pressing. Okay, Alex? Keep pressing All right. profane worship. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Jackie. Okay. God bless you. You're welcome. Bless you too. Okay, Joanne? Um, I went to um, the Mercy Courts uh, quite a few times, and uh, sometimes I don't understand. Speak closer to it. Um, I went to the Mercy Courts quite a few times. Uh, I was always very touched by the spirit. Sometimes I don't, um, I don't know what it means. Um, there's one thing that happened is I got the, the book of life. I'm laying down on a table, like a really strong tumble, with a nice book. Um, I don't believe there was anything um, written inside. I'm still happy to receive it, but I'm just, uh, the symbols are not very clear. Okay. I would recommend you go back through and do the confession of faith in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Have a date that you know that you have stepped into life. I really would. You've yeah, got, you've, you've what got so word? much um, demonic oppression coming against you. Yes. you. And you really need to be praying over your house. You okay. need to be applying the blood of Jesus to the atmosphere of your house. Yes. To the anoint the doors and windows yes and you need to get yourself into a really good church where you have community and fellowship and you can be trained up in the word of god i can't find a good church but anyway okay so i'm gonna you should seek the holy spirit to know what if there's anything in the house to get yeah my husband just said you need to seek the holy spirit to make sure there's nothing in the house that gives ownership i'm gonna mute you now Okay. Is your hand still up, Alex? If you're if you're finished, please take your hands down. Please take your hand down, Joanne. I've got lots of people I need to talk to. Okay. Um, it was I let someone come in. Let's see. It's Galaxy Prime. Um, I'm unmuting you. Please introduce yourself. I keep on unmuting you, but you're not, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Please. Yeah, tell us who I, you are. Uh, my name is Felicia. I was at work. I was listening on my computer, but I knew if I wanted to ask questions, I ended up turning it to my phone. So I wanted to pull away because I didn't want to ask out loud in front of everybody. But my question was, um, 
I had a question. I'm I'm experiencing things as far as like um, I, I'm assuming it's like monitoring spirits or witchcraft because I keep seeing black hats outside my door, and it's like causing me like tremendous amount of fear. Okay. Um, and also, um, like today, this morning when I left for work, I saw. I try not to look because I just get so afraid every time I um, see it. But then also, too, I'm having issues as far as like, um, you know, so much division in our family and stuff. And my dreams are being blocked. I can't remember like my childhood. and I can't remember my dreams. I can't recall them. So I know that there's a blockage there. And I'm, I, I love what you said earlier. That's what I'm doing, fasting and seeking and praying and um, like really tuning in to God because I really need a breakthrough in my life. Right. Um, what's so, your nationality or what's your DNA, I should say? Because um, nationality, I'm, I'm, American. I'm African American. I'm African American. The, the roots and the witchcraft of um, Africa are very, very real. When I was working at Ebor in Tampa and I'd taken the position, mm -hmm. um, I'd replaced a woman who retired and she was a black professor that was known statewide who had handpicked her successor and the Lord told me he wanted me to to apply for this position and I basically said I don't want the warfare and the Lord said I want you to do this because I want you to be a healing bomb to my people yes and I went under a good five years of heavy witchcraft against me yeah that's what I'm dealing with okay and I had to use um, Isaiah 43.10 is a scripture that I would pray over my life. Okay. I also had to pray Psalm 64 when it says God shoots the arrow suddenly. Okay. Okay. I had to make sure there was no witchcraft in me that had made it an open door. I had to make sure that I was, wasn't holding a fence against the people who were using witchcraft against me. Okay. And I can remember one time coming home from work at night. And I mean, I had staff, I was a professor and I had staff members who were black, who would yell at me in front of my students, who would sabotage me, who would do, who would hide things that I needed, who made life miserable to the yeah. best of their ability, not to mention the roots that were being done. So I'm coming home, I'm driving home one day and night and I am just done. And all of us get to a place where we're yeah, done. That's where I'm at. <laughs> and I went, Lord, do you see what they're doing to your daughter? You know, because <laughs> I have a very strong sense that I'm a daughter of the most high God. And I've had that for a long time. Okay. And the Lord spoke to me very, the way he does good correction. And he said, daughter, I don't care what they're doing to you. I care about your reaction. Wow. Okay. So I want you to write notes asking forgiveness for every, for every one of them for your reaction. Okay. And I did that. Then he told me to bake bread and give it as a gift. They wouldn't even eat it. They were certain I'd poison it. Because again, they look on you and they think you're going to have be doing to them what they're doing to you. Okay. 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 So then he gave me Psalm 37. Psalm 37, in at least three places in Psalm 37, it says, fret not because of evildoers who prosper in their way. Do good. So he said to me, this is all happening during that time where I'm writing these letters and I'm baking my bread, homemade bread. Um, he said, do good. Whenever any one of them asks you to do anything, you will do it with a smile. No matter how difficult it is for you, you will react with grace and mercy. Okay. Now, God in his rich, rich mercies in that situation he totally turned the tables. And because we turned the tables, and because I got my heart right, we were able to go into Haiti and be there for nine months teaching the church, teaching leaders how to pray. 
and also prayer walking the land. And as the way I put it, we survived. Okay. okay. So it's learning how to walk in the midst of perversity. It's learning how to walk in the midst of witchcraft. Okay. Thank you. So do I read, do, do I pray those scriptures, the one you just gave me? Oh, yes. And okay. pray the do good and really meditate on it. Okay. Isaiah 43, Psalms It's so 64. important that the word of God drop into us and we have faith in what the word of God says. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let me go down. Um, I'm going down to talk to people who have raised their hand and we haven't. Okay. Tamara, I'm unmuting you. Where are, where'd you go, Terry? You're going to unmute you, Tamara. So what's your last name, Tamara? Tamara? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. I'm so sorry. Okay. It's Tamara, Tamara Haskin. Oh, hi, Tamara. How are you? Hi, good. How are you doing, Jackie? I'm doing well, considering I'm teaching this all by the Holy Spirit. It's been quite a journey for me. It's wonderful. Well, I do have a question to bring to you. I, I'll, I'll, I almost don't know how to ask it, but I'll I ask the Lord to just help me to articulate it. Um, you know, as I had mentioned once before, I was um, on a prayer journey of repentance, praying Natasha Gribbage's um, repentance book. Uh, I, I prayed through that book for about two and a half months, and the Lord really ripped things out of my own heart and showed me, you know, deep things regarding my bloodline, bloodline curses that I was repenting for to gain, you know, to, to nullify legal rights, you know, that the right. enemy has had in my family, I discovered that in many ways, repentance is just as strong, not stronger than warfare. <laughs> but um, it, it really is. But um, um, after about this two and a half month journey, the Lord began to show a root issue in my own life. And that is one of codependency. And codependency, there's six different types of codependency. People generally think it has to do with being needy. But the type that I have most operated in and that's also prevalent in my bloodline is overgiving and overfunctioning in relationships. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as an intercessor, as, you know, a minister, I have given so much of my life to pray for people and to help people to the point that I've excluded my own needs mm -hmm. and I've been left hurt and, you know, financially broken, just like, you know, everything. And I'm so grateful that the Lord has shown me this and I'm dealing with, you know, the, it's like open wounds in my heart now. And I'm, um, you know, I've gone through a lot of repentance and I'm now really filling myself with the word of God, purposely exposing my heart, to, to let the, the word of God heal me. My concern though, is when I'm looking at, I learned code, okay, codependency, codependency is in my bloodline, but it was reinforced in me personally when I worked as, as leadership in the church because we were encouraged to pray for people, help people, counsel people, give up your own life and your own personal needs. And just, you know, I was in the church, you know, before the doors opened and the last one to leave. I was pastor, secretary, worship leader over all these committees. I understand what you're saying, Lindsay. I'd like to give a response to you. Please, yes, thank you. I recommend you read the book Crucified by Christians by Jean Edwards. Crucified by Christians. Okay. Right. Now, all of us who have been walking with the Lord and have been in our zeal, in our beginning of our walk, in a perversion of the crucified life, we have allowed ourselves to be used and abused because we, mm -hmm. we see the serving of the church or the serving is the people, as the serving of Christ. Okay? Yes. So, I have had to learn, and this is something I have learned over many decades. I've been 
I've been spirit filled since I was 30 years old. That's 42 years. And I have been involved in major churches. I have been involved with ministries. I have suffered many, many wounds at the hands of church leadership, of the hands of people I trust. Crucified by Christians took all of that pain, all of the woundedness, and I was able, I only read, read a chapter a day. And mm -hmm. I wept through that book. And when I finished, I truly came off that cross of crucifixion, mm -hmm. off the pain. And I was able to truly go through it. And you're not, and you're really free of it when you don't think about it, you don't talk about it. You, you just see it as part of what God was working in you to show you what is in you. So we have, it's, it's in our carnal nature. We want to please man. We want to please God, but we don't understand how we please man and how we please God. And that's why we have to get to the place where we ask, what do I do, Lord? Yes. What, what would you have me to do? It's like as I'm preparing these teachings, I am very good at sitting down and doing an outline or pulling a PowerPoint together. I'm trained in teaching. So I know how to do that. And the Lord challenged me at the beginning of the series. And he said, will you let me teach through you? Now that means all week long, I am in my books that I'm reading. They're, they're like just that I'm meditating on. And out of it, prayers come. And, and insight comes. I'm in my scriptures. Mm -hmm. I'm in my time with him. And then I say, okay, Lord, only what you would have me to do. Now, this has shown itself in my refusal to become a priest and part of the Nicolaitans, where I separate people from God. I separate them from the mercy court. I, I, I'll train you how to go into the courts of heaven, but I cannot do it for you. I'll demonstrate the courts of heaven to you, but I cannot do it for you. Yeah. And the Lord has made this very clear. I cannot merchandise my gift. Mm. And people get upset with me. They write me these, these emails asking for help. It's not that I don't want to help you, but I want to help you by teaching you how to fish, by encouraging your own seeking and finding of God, your own relationship, your own fellowship, your own communion with him. So mm. what I'm telling you tomorrow is stop ministry right now. Yes, take I have. A sabbatical. I have. Okay, yes. Take a sabbatical and set aside time every, every morning where you're just seeking him. Start with crucified by Christians and yes. allow that reality that God allowed the crucifixion. Who is the author of our crucifixion by Christians? It's Father. Allow that to come into your heart and heal the wounds. Because I full well know the wounds of use and abuse. Okay. God bless Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Mark. you very, very much. You're welcome. Okay. All right. Marembi, I'm going to allow you to talk. Okay. Marembi? Talking's permitted. I'm unmuting you. Okay. Marambi? 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 Yes. Okay, Hello. go ahead. Oh. Hello, Jackie. Hello. Yes. Uh, I've been praying for my family and myself because so many things have happened in a family. And I was praying for our blessings, our marriages. And then one day I dreamt my grandmother who passed away. I had a bottle of peanuts. And there she was, there she was, she was trying to grab it. We fought for it and she grabbed it. My mother who passed away was looking at her so annoyed. She grabbed it, she took it away. And in me, I felt that what she had taken were the blessings for my family, 
blessings, prosperity, and marriages. How can I pray for that back? How can I pray it back? Because I've been trying to do that, and I haven't seen any results. Have you been using my book, Miranda? No, not yet. Oh, you have to use the book. Which book? It's, not, it's, it's Silence the Accuser. I took you to the website today. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not that silencing the accuser is the begin all or end all of any of this prayer. Because we personally have used Natasha Gribich's book, Repentance. I go to Paul Cox's website and I pray his prayers when the Lord quickens me on something. So it's a journey. And yes, you want to release the blessings, but first you have to release the curse of broken covenants. Okay. All divorce and marriages that are in trouble are suffering from the curse of broken covenants. Okay. Okay. And it's in families and if, and it's the, it's just broken covenants. And this is broken covenants between husband and wife through adultery, broken covenants between God and man, broken covenants in business. Mm -hmm. In family, sometimes there's a lot of witchcraft that's coming through the grandparents, the great grandparents. And that witchcraft is going to hold a family in poverty. It's going to hold them in a place where they never experience the blessings of God. Okay? Thank you. So get my book, please. Okay. Okay, let's see who else has their hand up. I'm going to people who haven't talked yet. Okay, I'm going to go back to you, Adoka. Um, okay. You can talk. Adoka, I'm going to unmute you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I was wondering if you would, if you, what you could, what you would think about um, including a list of books or resources recommended reading other than your own on the website because you it's on the website under resources oh, oh really sorry <laughs> two pages of recommended reading oh with I didn't know sites. Um, the Lord I've been on a journey for the last seven months um, I had cre after we finished the lower level and what you're seeing behind me is my studio office in the lower level of our home and I took what had been our office upstairs and I made it into my personal prayer room. And I literally have a chaise that I sit on and look out into the trees and at the pond because we live in the mountains and I have a beautiful, beautiful view. And I, I started, I have, a, I have a bookshelf. I've got hundreds and hundreds of books that I haven't read. Over the years, I'd buy them, I'd start them. I just couldn't read them. And during this season, I go to my bookshelf and I say, okay, Lord, what would you have me to read? And I had been working one that's called the prayer circle, or the circle in prayer, something like that. And it was a 40-day meditation. And then I got another book out, and the one I picked up was Crucified by Christians. I have been so tender for the last seven months. I cannot be in that chase without weeping. I have, I have been in the most tender time of my life. I think the revelation of scripture has become so alive to me, but it's because I'm seeking. I'm really, really pressing into the Lord. I'm pressing into understanding. So we, it's important that we do this. See, it's not just courts. It's relationship with him. It's worship music. We're going to be putting up a list of music. I always play instrumental music when I'm doing this. I'll put Eric Gilmore on, his intercession. There's certain Eric Gilmore, because um, they're full, like some of them will be an hour or more. And they're just too jarring for my spirit. I need soothing. And I put that on as I'm going through this. And during that time, I'm praying for you all, everyone who participates in these courts, everyone who's using the website and using the book. I'm praying light and revelation into your spirits. But the biggest journey you must begin on is you must develop that relationship with Jesus Christ as a friend, as a lover, as a redeemer, as a king of kings. And this is something, this is, 
This only happens when you take yourself off the throne. When you take your ego out of the way, when you take your opinions out of the way, and you utterly surrender to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and you truly make a covenant of life with him. This isn't salvation. This is the beginning of sanctification, and it's a crucifixion fiction of your flesh. I have a quote I was going to read today. I'll read it now. In every Christian's heart, there is a cross and a throne. And the Christian is on the throne until he puts himself on the cross. If he refuses the cross, he remains on the throne. Perhaps this is at the bottom of all backsliding, worldliness, dullness of spirit, inability to have relationship with Jesus Christ. Of believers today, we want to be saved but we insist that Christ do all the dying. No cross for us, no dethronement, no dying. We remain a king within our little kingdom, and we wear our tinsel crown and all the pride of Caesar, but we doom ourselves to the shadows, weakness, and spiritual sterility. If we do not die, then we must die the death and that death will mean the fourth, fourth forged forfeiture of many of those everlasting treasures which the saints have cherished. Our uncrucified flesh will rob us of purity of heart, Christ-likeness of character, spiritual insight, fruitfulness, and more than all, it will hide us from the vision of God's face. That vision which has been the light of earth and will be the, bring the completeness of heaven. So when it says, I have been crucified by Christ, Paul says in Galatians 2.20, and it's not I that live, but Christ that lives in me. When we're crucified, if you want to try begin your crucifixion, go to identity and self in the book. And identity of self is when I had to crucify, I had to strip off from my identity that whole reality of being a college professor. I was a full professor. But I do not go around and tell people about my degrees because my degrees do not define me. My positions at the different colleges do not define me. My calling, gifting, ministry, none of that defines who I am. What defines me is I'm a child of the Most High God. And he is my father. And Jesus Christ is my brother, my friend. My okay. Thank you, Yuduko. Thank you. Okay. Um, Galaxy Prime again. I'm going to unmute you. Can't hear you. You're too far from the phone. Can't hear you. Okay, I'm going to mute you now because it's, you can't hear you. Okay, Hania, I'll unmute you. We only have another seven minutes that I'll take questions. I have recorded all of this. So when I post it on, and I'm going to post it under videos, Mercy Court, that's where you're going to find it. I'm not sending it out as an email any longer. Okay, so know where you're going to be able to find this and where you can tell your friends to find it. Okay, um, Hanai? I've yeah, been... yeah. I'm just, uh, I just want to ask a little bit, the book you mentioned, Crucified by Christian, is it a book by Jean Edwards? Yes, it is. You can find all my recommended books under resources on the um under prayers and it's got resources and it's it's there under that i've got two pages of books that i've been using and i will just keep on adding books as the lord allows me to be absolutely broken by these books okay yeah thank you and uh, is there um also a book you want to recommend or in your uh, list book uh, uh about prayer against witchcraft and renunciation and so and so because 
that witchcraft uh, I, I i i must say it's really too much in, in my life and around me so i need really to go deep in that so well, do you the way you're going to do that is the profane worship the enemy mm -hmm. has no right to you mm -hmm. only what is in you where there is ownership so witchcraft cannot come against you it can only if if you have removed the legal rights so that's why you have to go in and do the profane worship there's at least 10 prayers in the profane worship and you have to do it and then you have to begin to say okay lord you show me what my steps are to be free of the fear now the enemy puts fear in us and as long as he has that fear because the lord told us he has not given us a spirit of fear but sound mind power and love so when we have fear of the enemy it's because in our generations they our ancestors knew the power of darkness and we have to so know the power of god so we have to be baptized in the holy spirit we have to immerse ourselves in worship we have to focus on him and him alone our soul is where the fear resides and you have to ask the Lord to deliver you a fear, fear of torment, fear of the enemy. So this, it's a journey. And sometimes you might need personal deliverance in order to be set fear, free from your fear. I know that I did. Okay? Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, let me see who else hands are up. Okay, I'm going to allow Nurse Ann 8 to talk and I'm gonna unmute you okay okay nurse Ann nurse Ann okay I had unmuted you okay I don't know what's happening I don't know why I can't un unmute you okay I'm at the place I'm honey uh, we spoke twice already I'm I need to have nurse Ann be able to speak okay okay I'm unmuting you nurse Ann nurse Ann eight okay it's not working so I'm going to end this with a prayer today I truly hope that out of all of this that you're beginning to see the incredible importance of dealing with the profane worship. I can't tell you, I want every one of you to deal with it again using the book. Realize as you pray the prayers, you need to springboard. Springboard means you pray a sentence, the Holy Spirit quickens something in you. You remember something in the, a conversation with a grandmother, something that happened in your life. And you bring that into the prayer and you repent for it. I want everything that everything to be done because next week what I'm planning on doing is I want to be doing a divorce, go to the court of divorce to divorce you from the bloodline elders. Okay. So bless you. And I will, we'll be together again next week. Thank you. And goodbye.